Hi everyone, my name is Benjamin Mammon. I'm a fourth year UBC medical student and I was diagnosed with T1D 15 years ago. So I've had the opportunity to use and evolve with a lot of the technology that I'm going to be speaking to you about in this presentation. And I wanna start by telling you what I think the goals of this presentation are. And that's not to try and convince you to start using DIY systems. My goal is rather to create awareness about the DIY movement and make sure that people understand the risks and benefits associated with these systems if they choose to use them. And it will also hopefully help you understand some of these shocking headlines in the mainstream media like diabetics are hacking old insulin pumps as an alternative to delayed innovations. I have no disclosures. I'm not affiliated with any of the companies I'm going to be speaking to you about. And this is our schedule. I'm going to start by talking to you about the We Are Not Waiting movement and go into a bit of the history and key players that have been involved. And then I'm going to briefly touch on Night Scout. And I'm going to spend most of the presentation talking about the DIY hybrid closed loop systems. And then at the end, I will briefly touch on a few other DIY projects and then end by discussing the future. Hashtag we are not waiting is a movement within the diabetes community by patients and their loved ones frustrated by the slow pace of development in the medical industry. Instead of relying on the industry, patients have decided to take a DIY or do it yourself approach. And this has taken the form of developing various platforms, apps, cloud based solutions, and even reverse engineering existing commercially available products, all to help people with diabetes better utilize devices and health data for improved outcomes. And these are just some of the systems I'm going to be talking to you about today. But before I do, I want to start with a story. And the story begins with John Kostick. He's a software engineer from New York, and his son Evan here was diagnosed with type 1 in 2012 at the age of 4. And I want to take you back to that time in the diabetes tech world. You have continuous glucose monitoring just taking off with the Dexcom G4. And this system involves a transmitter that relays information to a handheld receiver that displays the data to the user. And the limitation of this device is that you could not view this data remotely. You have to carry around this receiver in order to be able to see what your CGM data is. And for John, that was unacceptable. He has a young son who's about to start kindergarten, and he wanted to be able to see Evan's blood sugars while he was away from home. So being a software engineer, he plugs in the Dexcom receiver into his laptop and starts decoding its communication protocols. And he ends up writing a simple program that transmits the monitoring data to a Google Docs spreadsheet, which he could access as the day went along just by going online. And then he developed an Android app and plugged the Dexcom receiver into the phone instead of his laptop. So as long as his son Evan carried around this receiver Android phone combo, John was able to view his blood sugars in real time from any internet connected device. And he starts sharing pictures of his setup on Twitter. These are some of those early photos of him remotely monitoring his son's BG in 2013, which is two years before the Dexcom G5 would start uploading to the cloud. And you can even see here he's using a Pebble watch to view uh, his son's data. And these Twitter photos are really what make people start to take notice because these posts begin to spread to a legion of parents that are also eager to view their children's BGs remotely so that they can monitor them while they're at sleepovers, at school or daycare. And one of the parents that ends up seeing John's photos on Twitter is Lane Desborough. He's another type one dad and chemical engineer from California. He was actually the chief engineer at Medtronic Diabetes back in 2013. And the two of them begin collaborating on improving the code. And they decide to upload their work to a website called GitHub and make it public, make it open source so that anyone can see the code that they're working on and make contributions to it. And that's exactly what happened. You have dozens of other tech savvy parents or individuals with type one begin joining and working on this project. And someone eventually makes a Facebook group called CGM in the cloud to keep everyone connected. And then they create a website with easy to understand installation instructions so that any parent could have access to this technology. And they decide to call the project Night Scout. And what the project allows you to do is build your own personal website 
that displays your pump or CGM data in real time. This is a screenshot from the Night Scout website where you have a bunch of setup guides explaining how you can create your own site. And this is what a modern Night Scout site looks like. This is an example of what a URL might be. So you can plug that URL into any internet browser and get this information just on your computer or on your phone, uh, wherever you happen to have access to the internet. And I want to point out a few things about this Night Scout site because there's a lot going on. So I want to just break it down a little bit. These um, blue lines here represent a person's temporary basal rates. And you can see that they're fluctuating as their continuous glucose monitoring data comes in. And that's because they're using an open artificial pancreas system um, to regulate their blood sugar levels. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, but those blue lines are the patient's basal rates. The dotted blue line is what their scheduled basal rate is in their insulin pump. And this box over here tells you uh, the pump status. So you can tell that you have 120 units remaining in your insulin reservoir in your pump, and the pump has this much voltage left in its battery. These are prediction curves that tell you what your blood sugar might be doing in the next hour or hour and a half. And these are based on the prediction model in the hybrid closed loop system. And these boxes tell you the age of your cannula, and this one's the age of your sensor. And we know that these values are important because as the age of the cannula gets older, the insulin might not absorb as well into your body and likewise, if your sensor gets too old, the readings may become inaccurate. So it's important to monitor these two values. And this box here tells you your current basal rate, your carbs on board, your insulin on board, the delta from your last blood glucose value, and this is your current blood sugar in this moment. And this is just a longer graph over time. Um, and this is a more of a shorter one that you can customize to either show you two, three, six, 12, or 24 hours of data. And just wanna compare that to what you see when you pull up the Dexcom G6 app. And as you can see here, you really only get a brief trend line, um, the trend arrow and your current blood glucose value. So when you look at a Night Scout site, you just get so much more information, which is a lot better when you're trying to manage a condition like type 1 diabetes that requires minute by minute decisions based on all of the values that Night Scout is able to show you. And in addition, Night Scout has a very rich reporting feature. Um, so you can have different tabs here to create different reports. And this is accessible directly from the Night Scout site. And it's great because instead of just having like your Dexcom clarity information and then your um, pump data, this actually combines everything into one report so that you can see how your insulin and your blood sugars relate to each other. And of course you can form many really cool different reports here. This is my data from the past couple weeks. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of the different information that you can create and share with your diabetes team uh, to help you make uh, adjustments to your insulin pump therapy. And I just wanna share this quote from Lane Desborough, who's here on the left, and this is John Costick on the right. And Lane says, I would say Night Scout began on John Costick's driveway Saturday, August 24th, after a delightful evening with his family. We talked about the personal risks of getting sued, and in my case, fired as chief engineer at Medtronic Diabetes, if we combined our code and open sourced it. We talked about how it was unfair for other families not to benefit from this transformative technology, and decided that the community benefits outweighed our personal risks. The rest, as they say, is history. And so at its inception, this CGM in the Cloud Facebook group had approximately 40 members, but it rapidly increased to more than 15,000 members within the first 18 months. And it now has over 33,000 members. But in addition, there are also 32 unique country-specific Night Scout groups on Facebook. And the actual code on GitHub has been translated into 25 different languages. There have been 147 different contributors to the code on GitHub. And in addition, the Night Scout Foundation was created, which is a non-for-profit that exists to encourage and support creation of open source projects through fundraising, advocacy, and direct software and hardware development. 
And now it's estimated that there's somewhere over 77,000 people worldwide in all these different Night Scout Facebook groups. And this whole movement is very interesting because we live and work in a healthcare system that typically embraces a top-down model of health production in which large-scale organizations are the ones producing the tools for improving health. But Night Scout is an example of a technology created bottom-up for patients by patients, and it was rapidly scaled to a global population in a relatively short time frame. And these are some pictures of how parents used to combine the Android phone and the Dexcom receiver using a 3D printed case in this instance so that they could send it with their kids and monitor them while they were away from home. And then you have this paper which talks about how Night Scout has been changing our current definitions of health production and how some critics might wonder if patients should even be doing this type of activity or if it's dangerous and the FDA should shut down the Facebook group. However, they argue that perhaps a different set of questions may be more relevant, such as how might the current healthcare delivery system integrate patients and caregivers more fully into the design of health technologies, and how might open source coding and social media be used for solving future problems in health. And just to give you an idea of where they are now, this is Lane Desborough. He is the co-founder and chief engineer of a software company called Bigfoot Biomedical. They have recently signed partnerships with Ypsomed and Abbott, and they are actively developing a closed loop algorithm to connect these two devices. And John Kostick is the director of mobile systems development at Beta Bionics, uh, which have their eyelet in uh, system that infuses glucagon and insulin, and it's currently in clinical trials right now. And that's a good segue into our next topic, which is the actual DIY hybrid closed loop systems. And that story begins with Ben West. He's a software engineer who was diagnosed with T1D in 2003 while studying music and computer science in college. And if you listen to some of his speeches, he talks a lot about the intimacy of having a computer plugged into your body and how these computers are programmed by humans with limited understanding. So he argues that we have a right to access our own data and our own device protocols in order to verify their trustworthiness. And in 2010, he actually called up Medtronic and started asking if they were willing to provide him with the software of the Minimed insulin pump that he was using at the time so that he could verify its safety. And of course, his requests were continually denied. So he decided to reverse engineer the pump himself. And he ends up spending the next five years decoding its communication protocols. And it's all done open source on GitHub. And he calls the project DecoCare, um, which stands for Decoding CareLink. And eventually, DecoCare allows him to use the CareLink USB stick like a remote control to read pump data and control his pump's functions. And DecoCare is often referred to in the DIY world as Ben West's magnum opus because it really is essentially the foundation for all of the DIY artificial pancreas systems used today. And then you have Dana Lewis, who's a digital health analyst uh, with T1D, and her husband, Scott Liebrand, another software engineer. And they were working on an algorithm that could predict blood glucose levels in response to trends compiled by a CGM, because Dana was trying to create better alarms for her CGM. And they end up meeting Ben West in 2014 at a conference and learn about how he's using this DecoCare program to control his insulin pump. And for them, that was really the last piece of the puzzle that they needed in order to close the loop and build the first DIY artificial pancreas. And they called their system Open APS for Open Artificial Pancreas System. And it worked using a little computer here called a, ra a Raspberry Pi, which would read CGM data. You can see it's hooked up to the Dexcom receiver here. So it's pulling in information about the patient's CGM and run it through a prediction algorithm, which they programmed into the computer. And that prediction algorithm would recommend increases, decreases, or no change to basal insulin delivery. And then it was able to issue the commands to the Medtronic pump using the CareLink USB stick as a remote control and Ben West's DecoCare program. And of course, the design improved over time. The CareLink USB stick was replaced with a smaller antenna capable of transmitting at the same frequency and the Dexcom G5 allowed CGM data to flow directly to the cloud without the need for the G4 receiver anymore. And so this is an example of what a modern day rig may look like. You have an Intel Edison, an Explorer block, 
and then a lithium polymer battery behind it with this antenna, and that can communicate directly to this Medtronic pump. This is a picture of my bedroom slash open APS workshop because I started building the system. This is when I got involved in the community three to four years ago and building my own rigs. And I just found it absolutely fascinating what Dana was doing. And so I got very invested and ended up learning a lot about electronics and computer science through assembling and troubleshooting these systems. And I was absolutely hooked because for the first time in over a decade, I could go to bed without worrying about not waking up in the morning from severe hypoglycemia or worry about waking up with ketones from being high all night. The system just helped keep me in range most of the time and it was incredible. You can see this is a screenshot from my Night Scout site and how my basal rates are just fluctuating and keeping my blood sugars perfectly in range. But the system did have limitations, especially with respect to setup, which used a command line interface. And it was a little intimidating for your average computer user, which I was at the time. And the instructions were very comprehensive, but did require a lot of patience and trial and error. I was using an iPhone and the official Dexcom app, which meant that the rig required an internet connection to read my CGM data from Night Scout. And I often had connectivity issues, so it wasn't particularly easy to use. And that's why I think general adoption in the T1D community was slow. But that's when these two come into the picture. This is Nate Rackleft and Pete Schwamm with his daughter Riley, who has type 1, and Nate has type 1. And they decided to do something different with Ben West's DecoCare program. Instead of running an algorithm on an external computer like a Raspberry Pi or an Intel Edison, they decided to create their own insulin dosing algorithm, but run it as an iPhone app, which they called Loop. And to control the Medtronic pump, Pete designed a clone of the CareLink USB stick, and he bridged it to a Bluetooth low energy interface in a device that he called the Riley Link named, of course, after his daughter, Riley. And the Loop app had a much easier to use interface like we're accustomed to with many iOS apps. And the installation was much simpler and it worked offline directly with the Dexcom app. So it really wasn't long before looping really started to take off. And now I'm going to talk a little bit more about how Loop actually works and some of the unique features that it has. And so as I mentioned, it's an iPhone app that controls your insulin pump but this app is not available in the App Store like you find most of your other apps, and that's because it's not approved by FDA or Health Canada. It's not approved by any health agency. So instead, you get the app onto your phone using a program called Xcode, and Xcode is used by developers in order to build new apps and put them on their phone. And so you can use this program on any Mac computer, and the code for the Loop project is all uh, easily found on GitHub. So as long as you have a Mac computer and use Xcode to download the program from GitHub, you can put it onto your phone if you pay for an Apple developer license, which costs 99 US dollars per year. And this is how the system works, essentially. If your blood sugar is going high, it will tell your pump to give you more insulin. And if your blood sugar is going low, it tells your pump to give you less insulin. And this is all done automatically, which is kind of how a pancreas works in a person that doesn't have type 1 diabetes. The blood sugars are being regulated um, with insulin in response to what those blood sugar levels are doing. And in order to tell the loop app what your blood sugars are, you need to use a continuous glucose monitor. And that will allow you to get blood glucose data into the app every five minutes. There's two uh, different systems that are compatible with the Loop app. You can either use the Dexcom system and their official app and get that into the Loop system. Or you can use a Libra with a Meow Meow or Bubble transmitter and use one of these other open source apps uh, to pull the data every five minutes and get it into the Loop app. And no matter which method you choose, the end result is Loop is going to understand what your blood sugar is at that given moment, and it's going to run it through a prediction model, which will recommend either an increase, a decrease, or no change to your insulin delivery based on that data, as well as your insulin on board, your carbs on board, and any other um, say, uh, parameters that you've inputted into Loop. And it does this by adjusting your basal rates 
but it can also administer boluses in the newer autobolus branches. And then how it communicates with your pump is through the Riley link. So the Loop app will connect to the Riley link through Bluetooth. This is an example of what the Riley link looks like. And then it transmits that data into radio frequency, which is how these two pump options receive the data. So you can either use an out of warranty Medtronic pump, or you can use an Omnipod system as of recently. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, how Omnipod became integrated into the loop system. And I just want to make some important points about the system to clear up any misconceptions. So loop is still reliant on your traditional pump settings. You still have to input your carb ratios, your ISF, and your basal rates. It's not a plug and go system. And it doesn't prevent highs or lows. It more acts like a buffer system so that as you are going high or you are going low, the system will start working to make sure you don't get too high or too low. And as a result, you just end up uh, with more time and range. Entering carbs is still required and it doesn't dose off of patterns. There's no artificial intelligence or machine learning. And in the event of a failure, say your Riley link dies or your phone gets lost, your pump will simply default to the scheduled basal rates. And now I want to walk you through some of the features available in Loop. You adjust all of your pump settings in the Loop app like this. This is an example of where you can program your delivery limits. And these allow a user to set a cap on Loop's ability to bolus or set a temporary basal. You can see that my maximum bolus is set to 14 units with a max basal rate of 5 units per hour. This is the correction range which is essentially your target or the BG you want the loop app to be constantly correcting you to. Mine is set at 5.2 to 5.8. And you can also set a pre-meal correction range. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And you can also set your suspend threshold. So just like it says here, when current or forecasted glucose is below this value, loop will not recommend a bolus and will always recommend a temporary basal rate of zero units per hour. And this is where you set your basal rates. And because this is an iOS app, it's super easy to add with the plus button here or edit or delete or adjust these basal rates. There's no more fiddling with all those button presses in a pump interface. You can see this is how you delete it. You just simply swipe to the left and press delete. Uh, and you can set as many carb ratios as you want. And you can set as many ISF values as you want. And this is that, uh, this is how you set that pre-meal correction range that I alluded to in the previous slide. You press this button here, which is the eating soon mode button. And when you press that, you can see that my pre-meal correction range was set to 4.5. And so the system now, instead of correcting me to 5.2 and 5.8, which was my usual correction range, will now uh, correct me to 4.5. So the whole idea is that Loop will deliver this small amount of insulin before a meal so that I have some insulin on board before I eat, and that will help control any post-meal spikes. And once you do bolus, you do go back to the regular correction range. This is how you enter carbs and bolus for food. You press this button right here, and you get to this screen where you enter the grams of carbs that you're consuming and what's cool is you can also account for the glycemic index of the food you're eating by specifying the absorption time. There are three presets. The lollipop represents an absorption of two hours, the tacos three hours, and the pizza is four hours. But you can customize as many presets as you want depending on your diet. And so after that, you just press go, and the system will recommend a bolus based on your carb ratio. And in order to deliver it, there's a safety feature where the user must use their face ID or touch ID or input their device passcode before the insulin is administered. And what's really cool is you can see all of these boluses and carb entries in Night Scout and the actual presets will show up there too so you can really analyze how different types of food are affecting your blood sugar. There are different insulin activity models in Loop and they allow for customization of your peak insulin time depending on the type of insulin that you're using. You can see here that 
for rapid acting insulin in an adult, uh, they, it uses a peak absorption time of 75 minutes, whereas for rapid acting insulin, it's based on empirical data in children where uh, the insulin will peak at 65 minutes. And if you're using FIASP, you can choose this model so that you peak at 55 minutes. And these were coded by the mathematicians of the looped group to better match the published absorption times of these insulins. And you can see this is an example of those published values um, from the activity of FIASP and NovaRapid. And you can see how they have created these different models that will correspond to these different absorption times. This is one of my favorite features in loop. It's the temporary override. And it's similar to a temp basal in that you set them for situations that are affecting your insulin needs. But instead of just altering the basal rate, they also change your ISF and your carb ratio together instead of a user needing to manually adjust each of these settings. So if you press the heart button here, you get to this screen where you can specify if the situation requires a 150% increase or a 50% decrease. And you can specify your desired target range over here. So like mine was set to 5.2 or 5.8 if you're perhaps going running and you wanna set um, a lower insulin requirement, you could maybe even set a higher target range to 8.5 if you wanted to. And then you specify the duration as well. And I created these overrides just to give you an idea of some different situations that you might use uh, because they are affecting your overall insulin needs. So this is one for running, this is one for hiking, or if you have a new site, if you have lots of hormones in your system, if you're sick and not eating as much, if you're biking or if you have ketones, but you can set an unlimited number of temporary overrides depending on whatever situations best correspond to your life. And what's very cool is that you can actually enable those temporary overrides remotely. So this is a screenshot um, of a mom who has a son with type 1, and she uses her Night Scout site to recommend those temporary overrides to her son. He'll actually get a notification on his phone saying, Mom has requested that you enable your, uh, or that the low temporary override is enabled. Do you accept yes or no? And he can decide. Um, whether or not to implement that recommendation. Loop is compatible with the Apple Watch, so you can bolus, set temporary overrides, enable eating soon mode, or add carbs directly from your watch. And this is easier for real-world insulin adjustments because, as we know, people are constantly on the go, and it's usually a pain to manage your diabetes, so this might be able to help you and if that's not convenient enough, you can also use Siri to do some functions like enter carbs or tell it what your BG is. And it kind of feels like you're having a conversation with your pancreas when you're using Siri. So these are all the requirements you need to get started with Loop. As we talked about, you need a compatible pump, um, either an out-of-warranty Medtronic pump or an Omnipod. You need the compatible CGM. You can either use a Dexcom or a Libra with a Meow Meow or a Bubble. You need a Riley link. You need an iPhone um, or an iPod Touch would work. And you need a Mac computer plus the Apple developer license in order to install the Loop app on your phone. And you might be wondering how you get one of these Riley links. And so Pete and Jeremy Lucas and other volunteers have started this website called GetRileyLink.org where you can buy one of these devices. They charge 150 US dollars, which just covers the costs involved in sourcing all of the components like the antenna, the circuit board, the battery, the 3D printed case, and putting it all together and shipping it to your house, which is very reasonable seeing as how they're all volunteers just doing this for the Type 1 community. And this is a picture of Pete's daughter Riley helping to assemble some of those Riley links and a huge shipment of them about to go out uh, to soon-to-be loopers, just to give you an idea of the grassroots nature of this project. And these are some screenshots of the Loop Docs website, which documents everything you need to know about looping. And there's even a step-by-step -step walkthrough in here of exactly what you need and how to install Loop. 
So it really just walks you through like click by click. So you don't have to be a computer scientist by any means anymore. You simply need to have access to the internet and be able to follow online instructions. And this is a Facebook group specific to loopers. We have more than 23,000 people in it right now. And it's a space for people to give and receive troubleshooting help and also share success stories. So if you go into the Facebook group in any given day, you're going to start seeing posts like this of people talking about their best A1C ever and how they've lowered their A1C since using Loop. And they're literally taking screenshots of their A1C and thanking the developers. And it's just really cool to be able to see so many people benefiting from the system. But of course, that's just anecdotal evidence. And so you might be wondering what the research has been saying about um, using Loop or a DIY artificial pancreas system. And so these are two recently published literature reviews that examined all of the available evidence on DIY artificial pancreas systems that they could find. And they ended up analyzing dozens of different published studies that have been related to people using these systems. And both of these reports identify the following outcomes. Decreased A1C, increased time and range, reduced glucose variability, reduced episodes of hypoglycemia, less reliance on accuracy of carb counting, improved overnight control, alleviated self-management with reduced mental burden. And the papers do bring up two major limitations to all of the studies that they analyzed, which are the small sample size and the short duration of testing. But both of these have been recently addressed by the Jabe Center for Healthcare Research in Tampa, Florida. They recently completed a large scale prospective observational study on looping. This is a picture of the invitations to be a part of the study that they sent with every person that ordered a Riley link from the Get Riley Link site. And they were able to recruit 873 new and existing users of the Loop app in the United States, and they followed them for 12 months. And they have finished the study. It's not published yet, but they did share some preliminary results recently in the Looped Facebook group earlier this year from a presentation that they did at the International Conference on Advanced Technologies and Treatments for Diabetes in Madrid. And this is what they presented. These are the demographics of the 607 new users that they recruited. 50% were in the pediatric age range. And these were educated families with good control at baseline. You can see they had a 6.8 A1C on average. 17% of people had experienced one or more severe hypoglycemic events in the three months prior to using Loop. And they defined a severe hypoglycemic event as a low blood sugar that affects your ability to think such that you were not able to treat yourself with carbs and needed the assistance of someone else to treat the low blood sugar. You may or may not have had a seizure or lost consciousness completely. And so 83% of people had zero of these types of events. And this is what happened when they looped for six months. You can see that their baseline A1C from 6.8 went to 6.4%. And this was without increasing um, the risk of hypoglycemia because the time that patients spent uh, below 70 milligrams per deciliter had decreased and the time that they spent below 54 milligrams per deciliter also decreased as they used the system. And their time and range increased. During the day uh, at baseline it was 68% and that went to 73% and at night it went from 65 to 73%. And this increase in time and range was found throughout the age groups. They also issued weekly surveys to screen for any adverse events. There was one DKA, but they deemed it unrelated to loop. And 93% of the participants had zero episodes of severe hypoglycemia compared to that 83% prior to looping. So in addition to showing safety, reduction in A1C, and increased time and range, they were also able to record statistically significant improvements in the Diabetes Management Distress Scale, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, and the Hypoglycemia Fear Survey. But despite all of the program safety features in Loop and this emerging evidence for safety, it's still not authorized by any federal health agency. It remains to be an open source project that you have to build yourself for yourself. And in May of 2019, the FDA actually issued this warning to people with diabetes and healthcare professionals about the dangers of using unauthorized diabetes devices. 
And this warning followed one adverse event that was reported to the FDA. It was a person using an unauthorized transmitter, so probably one of those meow meow or bubble or blue con transmitters, which outputted incorrect high glucose values. And they were also using an unauthorized automated insulin dosing device. It's unclear which system they were using, but it ended up administering insulin in response to that false high glucose reading. And this resulted in an insulin overdose that required medical intervention. And so the FDA was essentially warning that these devices were combined in a way that had not been thoroughly tested for compatibility. And one month later, they issued another notice about how Medtronic was recalling certain pumps due to cybersecurity risks. And of course, they were directly referring to the pumps that Ben West hacked using DecoCare. And so all versions and models of the Medtronic pump compatible with looping were recalled. And I get where these health agencies are coming from in these warnings and recalls because of that one adverse event. Yes, it is scary, but I want to remind you all that adverse events with insulin pump use are common. This was an article published by the CBC two years ago, and they found that insulin pumps were linked to more reports of injury and death than any other medical device. And that's including pacemakers, heart valves, defibrillators. You can see that there were 103 reports of death due to insulin pumps in the year 2008 to 2018 compared to 31 with mechanical heart valves. And you can also see how incidents are increasing in Canada as these systems become more common in diabetes management. And in case you didn't know, earlier this year, Medtronic recalled hundreds of thousands of their 670G and 630G Minimed pumps. The FDA actually identified it as a class one recall, which is the most serious type of recall. And it was due to a missing or broken retainer ring, which helps to lock insulin reservoirs firmly in place, causing under or over delivery of insulin. And this was only recalled following no less than 26,421 complaints with 2,175 reported injuries and one death. And remember that this is a commercially available system. So unfortunately, we have to be aware that safety concerns exist with all insulin pumps in use today, whether they use an automatic insulin dosing system or not. Diabetes technology does have limitations and we have to be responsible with how we use it. Loop has been designed with safety as a priority, which is the rationale behind the algorithms being openly sourced and available online for anyone to view. There are no financial incentives here, just simply a better quality of life. And the Loop users have decided that the benefits of being able to use this system outweigh any risks. And now I want to talk to you a bit more about these out of warranty Medtronic pumps, because initially these were the only pumps compatible with looping since these were the devices that Ben West spent five years reverse engineering the communication protocols for. This is a list of the compatible models and versions, the same ones recalled by Medtronic last year. In the newer pump models, Medtronic had fixed that software vulnerability Ben West had exploited to read and control his pump. And so there were a limited supply of compatible pumps in the community, and they were often highly sought after by people wanting to loop, sometimes selling for thousands of dollars in the black market on Craigslist, eBay, and Facebook. And in addition, they were prone to mechanical issues since they were out of warranty and not waterproof. So the DIY community really had to start looking for new pump options to ensure the longevity of the project. Even if they were to reverse engineer the newer Medtronic pump models, these pumps would eventually become out of warranty too. And so the pump that really became the holy grail in the DIY community was the Omnipod. And that's because this was a disposable, waterproof, and easily replaceable pump that's still under warranty. And the fact that it was tubeless uh, has been very popular with lots of people. And so in 2016, someone in the community named James Wedding created this bounty for anyone that could reverse engineer the Omnipod communications. And he started this site called openomni.org. And he was able to raise over 46,000 US dollars that would be given to the party that would, could reverse engineer the communication protocols in order to use an Omnipod to loop with. And it was a collaborative three year effort on GitHub, but eventually Pete made this announcement in the looped Facebook group that he had released his code for Omnipod support with DIY loop as a public testing version. 
And just to give you an idea of the lengths that a community of volunteers had to go to to get to this point, I want to go into a bit more detail here and tell you just how incredible the feat this truly was. It started in 2016 after the bounty was created. Pete looked for the public filing for the Insulet PDM at the Federal Communications Commission because every device that transmits in radio frequency has to be registered with the FCC. And he found that the operating frequency of the pod and the PDM was 433 megahertz. And so he used a device called a software defined radio to listen in on the communications between the PDM and the pod. And he could interpret these as ones and zeros, little bits. And he used a Python script to extract those bits and examine them as a whole package. And by doing this, he was able to figure out how the PDM sends commands to a pod, which would be important if the Riley link was going to be taking over that functionality. And then the team started dumping firmware from different chips on the PDM in order to decipher how the PDM was creating those commands. And they noticed as they were doing this that there was a four byte chunk of data near the beginning of every insulin delivery command and they couldn't decode it. It turned out to be something called a nonce, which is an arbitrary number used in cryptographic communication. And unfortunately, there were no clues about the nonce generating function in any of the chips that they had already dumped firmware from. But there was one chip left that they hypothesized contained the instructions for generating nonces. It was a custom chip made for Insulet, so there was no documentation online, and it was locked, which prevented firmware dumping. To find out more about the custom chip, some people even took x-rays of the PDM, which was cool, but didn't really show much. So eventually, someone on the team reached out to a researcher named Dr. Sergei Skorobogatov at the University of Cambridge in the UK who had experience in extracting code from locked chips using scanning electron microscopy. And he said that it would be expensive and, of course, not guaranteed, but he was willing to try it on this chip. And so Joe Morin organized and funded Dr. Skorobogatov to use a lab called Nanolab Technologies to decap and image the chip. But unfortunately, despite different attempts with different voltages, different surface preparations, and different equipment, the images of the silicone dye could not resolve the actual contents of the flash memory cells, and so they were left at a dead end. But Dr. Skorobogatov didn't give up. He was still willing to try one last resort proprietary method. But this required approval from the University of Cambridge and an NDA had to be agreed upon, so there were negotiations about who was to be the recipient of the extracted firmware. And it turns out that the Night Scout Foundation would ultimately be the party signing the NDA and taking on responsibility to prevent the unauthorized disclosure of the methods and results of the extraction. And the result of all this work is this incredible paper written by Dr. Skorobogatov, who was able to reverse engineer the locked chip. It's extremely technical and way above my head, but I present you with screenshots of the paper just to give you an idea of the level of complexity involved in this operation. And so the team was able to decode the nonce generating function in 2017, and then somebody wrote a Python program that could successfully generate the nonces, and now they had all the tools they needed to use the loop app like a PDM and issue commands to a pod. So Pete started writing new firmware to integrate Omnipod into Loop. He had to replace the antenna um, on the Riley link with this newer, longer one that was capable of transmitting at 433 megahertz. And then in October of 2008, Joe Morin became the first Omnipod Loop user. And then there was a small private testing group of 30 people. And eventually in April of 2019, the first version of DIY Loop for Omnipod was publicly released. And just to make sure everyone understands what that means, the PDM is no longer required. Now everything is done through the Loop app with the Riley link as the information bridge between the pod and the phone. So you do everything through the Loop app, including bolusing like we talked about, enabling all those different activity modes, and you even prime with the Loop app. And these are our pump options in British Columbia, Canada. You have the out-of-warranty Medtronic pumps, which I don't recommend anymore for the reasons that I discussed related to those mechanical issues. And then you have the Medtronic 670G with its $6,600 price tag. This is the only commercially available system in Canada that allows you to use a hybrid closed-loop system. 
but it does require special authority, which means that there's all this criteria your doctor has to say that you qualify for, such as two A1Cs, less than 9% in the past six months, and no DKAs for the past year. They basically want people with good control who are going to be responsible enough to use the machine. It's still subject to the Pharmacare deductible, which means that you have to pay 2% of your net income, and then it will cover be covered 70% and only covered 100% after you've reached the family maximum, which is 3% of your total income. Um, we also have the Tandem T-Slim, but it only has basal IQ. Control IQ is still not here in Canada. And even if it were, this is not covered at all by Pharmacare. You have the Ypso pump, um, which is again subject to the Pharmacare deductible, but does not have any hybrid closed loop functionality, and neither does the Medtronic 630G. And the Omnipod, on the other hand, is fully covered by Pharmacare. And so with a $150 Riley link, you essentially have a hybrid closed loop system with a tubeless in warranty pump, and you can use whichever uh, sensor that you want and control that whole system using your iPhone. So obviously we can see why Loop has been growing in popularity lately. And to help some of that interest in the T1D community, Nadine Peterson and I have helped organize these looping build parties where everyone brings their computers and all their supplies and we work together to help set up Night Scout and install the Loop app for new users. Dr. Tom Elliott was kind enough to let us use his clinic last year where we set up 11 people with a DIY artificial pancreas system. And this is me looping with my Omnipod and my new waterproof Riley Link case. I was on a kayak trip and the waterproof case allows me to loop anywhere in, I want, even in the middle of the ocean. I ran a marathon last year using a loop system. I had the Riley Link in my little belt here and my insulin pump I was using a Medtronic at the time um, on my hip and I've just overlaid what my blood sugars were for the duration of that race you can see that I had to carb load at the beginning um, and that because I knew I would drop as soon as I started running but the system suspended my basal delivery during that time and then titrated my insulin levels for the duration of the race and I ended up finishing a marathon with a blood sugar of like 5.5 and this is just some loop advice that I've put together if you're going to be starting the system or are currently using it. And it's important to continue those conversations with your endo around traditional pump settings like your basal rates and ISF and car ratios because as we've seen, loop still depends on that information. You should set reasonable values for your suspend threshold and your maximum basal rate. It's a good idea to initially set your maximum basal rate at a value that's less than or equal to three times your highest scheduled basal rate until you become more familiar with the system. And it might be a good idea to set a higher suspend threshold if you have hypoglycemic unawareness so that you're receiving less insulin before you get too low. Develop a plan for reviewing your data. As we've talked about, Night Scout reports may be more useful since they have so much more information in them. And you should definitely be sure to develop a plan for pump sensor or loop failures because as we've talked about adverse events with pump use are common so make sure you have a backup pump um, make sure you know how to use your pdm even though you won't be using it make sure your settings are up to date in there and also have a glucose meter with you so you can test your blood sugar if your sensor isn't working it's also a good idea to ask your endo for a prescription of long-acting insulin in case you were to go off your pump uh, that would be the only way that you would be able to receive basal insulin. I also recommend getting a good case for your Riley Link. They break easily. I've gone through a number and the waterproof one is ideal um, if you want to go and kayak like I am. Get a backup Riley Link. Um, if you happen to lose yours, it's very handy to have a backup or reach out to your loop friends in the looped group um, if you happen to lose yours. Keep your phone charged because as we've talked about, this is the only way that you can set boluses and adjust your insulin delivery. Uh, it's a good idea to carry around an external battery pack so that you can make sure your phone is charged as well as your Riley link. And stay up to date. Join the Looped Facebook group and follow the different developments and comments on GitHub. And read the docs. This is a link to the Loop Docs website, which walks you through everything you need to know about Loop. And Katie D. Simone has also created this website called Loop Tips, which gives you even more information about 
fine tuning your settings and some other things that might be helpful to know when you're starting to loop. And so now I'm just going to briefly touch on a few other DIY projects in the community. This is Android APS. Uh, the algorithm is housed in an Android app and Android APS is directly compatible with these Bluetooth pumps and you can also use an out of warranty Medtronic pump uh, with the Riley link. As far as I know, the Omnipod still isn't supported by Android APS, but I'm sure that it will be supported in the near future. And so what's interesting is there's actually three different DIY uh, hybrid closed loop systems available today, which provide people with the flexibility to really choose what system works best for them. As I've mentioned, Loop is by far the most popular due to it being the only system compatible with an in-warranty pump and just the user-friendly intuitive nature of the iOS app and that Loop Docs website, which really helps people install the system. These are transmitters that sit on top of your Libra sensor and transmit the data to your phone every five minutes. So they're actually converting the Libra into a CGM like the Dexcom with BG Alerts and the ability to drive insulin delivery in Loop. These are two of the more popular ones. They cost around 170 US dollars. And as I mentioned, they're not um, approved by any health agency. They're third party devices that you can use to connect to your sensor. Um, and if you do use them, you have to use one of these open source apps. There's Xtrip, Spike, Xtrip for iOS or Diabox. And what these do is convert that electrical signal from that uh, from your sensor into a glucose value, just like the Dexcom app does. And they are compatible with some um, iterations of the Dexcom transmitter and those Libra ones. If you're using one of these apps, I do recommend frequent calibrations with capillary blood glucose to ensure accuracies because we did have that one FDA report of the person who had falsely high BGs, which caused the system to give him too much insulin. Personally, I'm using the official Dexcom app to interpret my BG values because the G6 is the most accurate CGM on the market right now, and I depend on accuracy to drive my insulin delivery. But other people have different experiences and swear by the algorithms used in these apps. And if you're using the Libra, these are your only option for continuous glucose monitoring. These are CGM watch faces that people in the community have developed. There's literally hundreds of different watch faces available for dozens of different watch brands. This one here is called Sentinel, and it actually allows you to monitor more than one person with uh, T1D. You can see two different CGM trend lines, but you can use so many different types of watches in order to see what your blood sugar is right on your wrist. And these are different 3D printed cases. People are actually sharing uh, their digital design files directly on this website called Thingiverse. So you can go on there, and if you have access to a 3D printer, you can download the files and use them to print your own Riley Link case. This person's actually created a phone case um, that incorporates a Riley Link, so you don't need to carry around two different devices. You can just have them together in one system. And you can also buy uh, cases from these websites down here. This is from the Loop Cases website. You can get any different color Riley link case that you want um, and the T1D 3D care website allows you to have these cases where you can actually insert a tile with your Riley link so you can keep track of it and make sure it doesn't get lost and plastic pancreas is another one. Something else that people in the DIY community have been doing for a long time are replacing the batteries in their Dexcom transmitters. And that's because these transmitters are disposable. Once the batteries die, you have to throw it out and buy a new one from Dexcom. And they cost $289 each. And if you wanna be looping for a full year, you need four of them. So it's quite expensive um, because you have to just simply buy a new one when this one dies. And so some people have started just replacing the batteries on their own. They sand them down and then buy new button cell batteries and just replace them themselves. And then they can actually coat them in epoxy to make them waterproof again. And you can even add really cool designs like this to customize your transmitters. And some people have even gone as far to create rechargeable Dexcom transmitters 
um, that you can buy from them as well. This guy I know is selling rechargeable G6s, and this is someone else who has just created a rechargeable Dexcom G6. Autotune is another project in the DIY community. It's an algorithm that will recommend different setting adjustments based on the data housed in your Night Scout. So if you go to this website here, you can actually just input your Night Scout URL and choose um, how long you want it to analyze the data for, and then it will spit out some recommendations like this. You can see it's recommending that I de er, increase my ISF to 4.0 and decrease my carb ratio, and then it also has some recommendations to my basal rates as well. And lastly, I'm going to talk to you about the future. Tidepool is a software company that is building an FDA regulated version of the Loop app for the iOS App Store. And it's going to be interoperable with commercially available devices. They've already signed partnerships with Insulet and Medtronic for compatibility with their new Bluetooth pumps, the Omnipod Dash and Medtronic's MiniMed. And they've also have a partnership with Dexcom to incorporate their um, continuous glucose monitor, the G6. And the way they're going about receiving FDA approval is through this framework here. We already have integrated continuous glucose monitors, um, which the Dexcom G6 has that designation, and alternate controller-enabled pumps, the Tandem T-Slim has that designation. And so that is what allows those two systems to be used together. And so what Tidepool is trying to do is create this new eye controller designation, which will allow it to have a system called Tidepool Loop that will be able to um, be used with an alternate controller enabled pump and an ICGM. And this is a picture of the some of the people on the team. And you might notice this guy here, this is Pete Schwamm, who was the same guy who helped develop the Loop app and create the Riley link and decode the Omnipod's communication protocols. Tidepool has actually hired him to be the Tidepool Loop technical lead. And so in the future, you're going to see a system that looks something like this, where we have the Loop app directly communicating with the Omnipod dash because this pod is Bluetooth compatible. You don't need a Riley link anymore as the information bridge. And then of course the Dexcom system communicates through Bluetooth already. And so you'll only need your Dexcom and the Omnipod Dash, and it will all be controlled through the Loop app on your phone. And that's all the equipment you're going to need in order to use a hybrid closed loop system. And of course, there are many other companies who are also designing their own hybrid closed loop systems. Eli Lilly is building one. We have T Slim with the Control IQ and Beta Bionics we already talked about, Diabaloop in the EU and Bigfoot Biomedical and even Omnipod is creating their own automated glucose control system. Um, and I just wanna end by showing you this slide here because I want to remind you that next year will be the 100th year anniversary of the discovery of insulin. And hopefully we're going to be able to see Tidepool Loop or some other one of those closed loop systems come to Canada and be affordable for everyone that has type one diabetes uh, to be able to access that technology. But until that day, we are not waiting. Thank you for listening. This is my email address if you have any questions and a link to the LoopDocs website where you can find more information about Loop.